How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Every year, Climate One grants an award in memory of the late Steve Schneider, a pioneering climate scientist who fiercely took on the denial machine from the 1970s until his death in 2010. This year's recipient is German physicist and ocean expert, Dr. Stefan Ramstorff. In a time of oceanic changes happening at an unprecedented pace, Dr. Ramstorff exemplifies the rare combination of superb scientist and powerful communicator in his work to convey the impact of climate on marine ecosystems, sea level rise, and increasing extreme weather events. He says it's imperative to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid even more disruption in the sea and along coasts. What's in store for our oceans and for us? Up next on Climate One. Back when you were just getting started in 2007 as a young scientist, you were attacked for calling out mainstream journalists who were skeptical of climate. What was the nature of those attacks and what was that for, like for you personally? You had a young child at that time. Uh, yeah, indeed, that uh, put a big stress on me, obviously, if you're attacked uh, and discredited in mainstream media and uh, calling out uh, disinformation on climate change. And how does that, uh, how has the conversation evolved or changed since then? Because now, uh, yeah, what's it like now compared to then? Is it better or worse now? Well, it actually, I think it's a lot better now because the uh, debate about climate change has moved on a lot. And uh, at least, you know, I can only speak for Germany here. There is no outright or very little outright denial of the basic scientific facts. The whole discussion has shifted to criticizing, uh, you know, the solutions, renewable energy, electromobility, et cetera. So it's, uh, the, the debate also in this field contains a lot of false information put out by interest groups, but it doesn't concern the basic uh, researchers, climate science researchers like myself so much anymore. Right. It seems like a lot of the skepticism about climate stems from the fact that climate models were predicting effects that most people weren't yet experiencing in their lives. You know, it was saying this kind of far away in time and far away, far away lands. You know, why do you think people distrust models and how both as a scientist and science communicator, do you explain why we should believe in the predictive models? Well, in a way, I can understand that people distrust models as such because they don't know what's in there. And uh, yeah, that, so they don't really understand in detail what we are doing. But I think one of the bigger factors beyond the healthy distrust of models that, that as scientists we also have, of course, we, we are very critical of each other's models and hopefully our own as well and you really have to learn what a model can do well and what it cannot do well um, but i think a big issue with the distrust of the general public of models and climate science uh, overall is that this has been deliberately stoked by interest groups and uh, so it's in a way it's not surprising that there is a lot of distrust there and have the models been conservative? Have the models actually underestimated the, the pace and magnitude of changes that we've seen in the atmosphere? That again depends on what you're looking at. If you are looking at the change in global average temperature, that has been spot on in the models since the 1970s and 80s. Already those early models got that pretty well right. Not only the models uh, by university scientists uh, or NASA, but also by uh, Exxon, for example, yeah. did their own modeling and they also got it pretty well right. Uh, there are other things that are more complicated physics, like rainfall extremes, for example, is more difficult and there there is still a lot of uncertainty in regional terms where 
where you expect what kind of extreme precipitation changes. And in one of my uh, fields of main fields of research for quite a few years has been sea level rise. That has also turned out to be quite a complex problem because there are several contributors, especially the, the ice sheets are very difficult to predict in their behavior. The sliding behavior it depends on the material properties of the ice. And uh, there we unfortunately have a history of underestimating sea level rise. And uh, the IPCC had to raise its sea level projections several times, basically every time in the last uh, three times a new report came out. The sea level projections have become more pessimistic as we learn more about potential ice sheet instabilities. So what I heard there is that, yeah, models are like a black box to most people, even me. Like, I've never actually seen a climate model. I've talked to lots of people who make them and, and uh, talked about them, but I've never actually seen a climate model. So they're a black box. And on surface temperature, they've been very accurate. And on sea level rise, they've actually underestimated something that is, is very complex. You said that we're running toward a cliff in a fog, and we don't know exactly where the cliff is. How far can models go toward letting us see through that fog? Well, this quote was about tipping points where we indeed, we know there are these tipping points, but we typically have a fairly large uncertainty range about exactly where this tipping point is going to be by at, at how much warming are we going to cross that tipping point. And this is a classic case because tipping points by definition are highly nonlinear phenomena. So complicated physics and this nonlinear phenomena, they depend exactly on the, on the boundary conditions. And in many cases, uh, we just can't pin that down very easily. Like I mentioned the global mean temperature just follows a global energy balance. We know how much radiation is coming in, how much long wave radiation is going out and how that's going to change when we increase the greenhouse gases because it's a fairly smooth change in the global energy budget. And so that's pretty easy to predict. But those cliffs, like the tipping points, uh, they are often well understood in principle, but not where exactly that cliff is. Let's talk a little more about uh, tipping points. In one of your talks, I've seen you show a graphic of various tipping points and at what temperatures they would be triggered. Can you talk through us some of the most imminent dangers? Because there's kind of three bands of tipping points, those that could happen relatively soon, those that are sort of medium term, and those that are, that are further out. Tell us some of the tipping points. What are the ones that are closest and ones that are a little further out? Yeah, this graph comes from a review paper in science uh, that was published published this September by David Armstrong McKay and colleagues from several countries. And in a way, it, it did really shock me to some extent, because there are now indeed, uh, when you put together the latest science, six tipping points that are even uh, not just possible, but even likely to be crossed within that range between 1.5 and 2.0 degrees of global warming. So that's not very far away, right? Exactly. The coral reefs, for example, a long time it has been known that they have critical temperature uh, thresholds. And we are now already since 2015 in the middle of a global coral die off. So we are basically we're in that uh, tipping point process now. And the latest IPCC report uh, reckons that after two degrees warming, basically no coral reef will be left. Another one is the West Antarctic ice sheet, which may already have passed the tipping point. Uh, I should add that uh, the tipping point is where the further uh, deterioration and actually complete loss of the ice sheet is already programmed in by self-amplifying feedback, even without further warming. Uh, so that's what the tipping point is, and it means you can't necessarily see it when it's happening with these ice sheets because they are moving very slowly and there's no dramatic change once you've passed the tipping point. But what it means is it's going to continue to decay until it's gone. In case of West Antarctica, that would be three meters global sea level rise. Similar uh, Greenland ice sheet, it's a different mechanism, but the same thing. We may already be passing the tipping point very soon uh, 
we might even already have passed it, and that would just mean the total loss of the Greenland ice sheet would be programmed in to occur over the next centuries and uh, unstoppable, basically. Let me just jump in here, Stefan. Uh, these are places most Europeans, Americans will never go to or see the West Antarctic ice sheet or the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, what does it mean for someone living in Europe, North America, anywhere? So why, why should a person care about these faraway things? Well, in case of the ice sheets, the main reason to care about them is the sea level rise they are causing. And uh, we are expecting, the IPCC is expecting uh, half a meter to one meter sea level rise by the end of this century. But with a big one-sided uncertainty to uh, much higher values like two meters by the end of the century, five meters by the year 2150, uh, as a result of potentially passing these tipping points where amplifying feedbacks really destabilize these ice sheets. And that means basically the loss of most of the world's coastal cities and also natural ecosystems along the coast, beaches being washed away by the rising seas, etc. And these things are closer and more likely than you estimated a couple of decades ago. Is that correct? Absolutely. Even, even closer than I thought five years ago. And then there's some that are further out that are, you know, sort of happen between two and four degrees. That is, you know, the Sahel. Tell us about the range, the Amazon and the Sahel, the things that happen between two and four degrees of warming, which we hope we won't get to. And we're currently on a trajectory. Um, if, if everybody meets their Paris climate agreements, we won't um, get to, to that point. But it could happen. It could happen. And uh, for the Amazon rainforest, uh, there is a tipping point where it simply gets too dry to uh, be maintained. And that has to do with the fact that the rainforest generates its own rain. It recycles the water that falls in one area. Uh, the roots pick it up from the ground again, push it up to the leaves, and they evaporate it again. And so that, that rainfall is recycled again and again by the forest. And uh, that is a self-sustaining feedback, which is typical for a tipping point, because when you stress that too much, it turns into the opposite. The, the forest uh, dies back, and that recycles less rain. That amplifies that dieback. And then the Amazon rainforest basically threatens to get so dry that big parts uh, go up in flames. Now, with the Sahel and West African monsoon, this is actually a positive tipping point, I would say. We're talking about a potential greening there, like we had in the first half of the Holocene, uh, where we had a stronger West African monsoon bringing in moisture uh, from the tropical Atlantic. And uh, so this could actually lead to a greening of the southern fringes of the Sahara. And so not all tipping points are negative, And we are all hoping for a societal tipping point where the world society finally takes climate change seriously enough to stop it. So there will be some, you know, that's a, a rare example of uh, actually something, a positive trend anywhere, and particularly for Africa. So there, are you saying there'll be winners and losers in this? Well, of course, that tipping point for the greening uh, Sahara will only be reached if we have pushed warming already far too far, way beyond two degrees, and we are in the middle of fighting a massive disaster. So that is little consolation that further out there may be even some positive change. And so what do you consider the role of a scientist? Because there's some data about whether scientists ought to stick to their, stay in their lane, stick to their laboratory, what they know, not veer into policy, not get into politics. Uh, so others say there's a moral uh, responsibility. What do you view as the role of a scientist at this time focusing on this? Well, I think we definitely have a duty to explain what we're doing and what we are finding out to the general public. Like doctors have a duty to warn their patients that smoking causes lung cancer. You know, you just, if you know about a risk that affects people, you have to speak up. I don't think uh, that necessarily it's a role of a physicist to tell the government what it should be doing. Um, and uh, we generally, I think, as scientists don't, uh, the IPCC doesn't. It's, you know, when the politicians 
um, want to know uh, how do we stop global warming, for example, at two degrees or so, then as natural scientists we can say how much, uh, uh, what's the emissions budget, you know, how much can we still emit in terms of CO2 if we want to stick to that goal. And so I think we need to communicate the risks, but not necessarily solutions. But there are other scientists like uh, renewable energy experts, economists, etc., that are really engaged in designing policy measures. For example, uh, a carbon pricing scheme that is fair so that low income households actually have, have more money in the bank afterwards. And so the burden for changing the energy system uh, and reducing CO2 emissions should really be paid by the high emitters, which are typically the people with more income. Yeah, the global north. We've done a number of episodes on that on Climate One recently from COP27. Um, much of your work has been in the field of paleoclimatology. How has studying ice ages informed your understanding of current and future climate change? And how do you communicate with people who average person has a hard time really grasping geological time scales. Yes, uh, I, I quite early already when I started as a postdoc turned to studying paleoclimate because, uh, you know, I was studying uh, abrupt ocean circulation changes and, um, you know, we can't observe that in the last hundred years, but we can if we go back further in time because they have happened repeatedly during the last ice age. So if we want to test our models, can they reproduce uh, these phenomena realistically, we have to compare them uh, to paleoclimatic so-called proxy data that come from the ice cores or uh, sediment cores from the deep ocean, etc. And uh, most people that I talk to or give lectures, uh, public lectures, they are amazed how much we actually know about past climate changes and about the mechanisms, especially when you look at the past few million years, uh, which of course is a short part of the total Earth history of, of four and a half billion years. But the last few million years, we have very nice data from sediment cores all over the planet. Uh, we know the, the waxing and waning of the big continental ice sheets. And with our climate model, for example, we can now reproduce all the ice ages of the last three million years. Um, just driven by the cycles in the Earth orbit, the so-called Milankovitch cycles, which are the cause of these cyclical ice ages. And so I think the main thing it teaches us is that the Earth system, the climate system, is a sensitive beast that responds strongly when you change the forcing, um, for example, either by these orbital cycles or by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. This is what we call a forcing, radiative forcing. And we know from the Earth history that the Earth responds very strongly to this. So that's the so-called climate sensitivity. How sensitive is our climate system? And uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Wally Broker, who unfortunately also already died like Steve Schneider, he used to say, uh, the, the climate is an angry beast, and we are poking it with sticks. It's an angry beast and a sensitive beast. That's quite a quite a powerful image. You mentioned the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, and how there's some melting there that's uh, faster. It's complicated, but faster than you would have predicted just a few years ago. We have enough ice left on Earth to raise sea level by 60 meters. That's 100 and almost 200 feet. This is a mind-blowing number. Obviously, you know, in your paleo work, you know it's been that high before, but not on an Earth with 8 billion people. So how do you imagine a 60-meter sea level rise and still function? I mean, that, that's just a mind-blowing number. Yeah, that, that is a really big number. And uh, we know that at the end of the last ice age, you know, which is only 10,000 years ago, so th that end, I mean, the height of the ice age was 20,000 years ago. And then uh, between 20,000 and 10,000, the ice age came to an end. We moved into the Holocene uh, warm period, the interglacial. And there, the sea level rose by 120 meters because two-thirds of those ice age uh, ice masses on the continents were melting. 
in response to about seven degrees of warming from the Ice Age uh, to the Holocene. Seven degrees centigrade global warming caused 120 meters of sea level rise. So the fact that we still have 65 meters worth of sea level rise lying in form of ice on the continents, to me, uh, it doesn't mean that sea level will ever rise by 65 meters because, um, well, certainly not in the next 1,000 years because Antarctica is simply right on the South Pole and very cold and it's uh, the main part, East Antarctica is not going to melt down. But what it means is that we can afford to lose only a few percent of that continental ice. And, you know, last time we had several degrees of warming, you know, two thirds of the ice melted, 120 meters of sea level rise. And now we're heading for three, four degrees warming, maybe half as much. And uh, we can't even afford to lose just kind of a few percent of the ice. Even one meter of sea level rise would for many places be really catastrophic. We're already witnessing real problems after the 20 centimeters of rise that we have seen uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, we have already at the US uh, East Coast, for example, the so-called nuisance flooding um, in, in quite a few places, uh, the Carolinas, um, Boston, for example, where even with the tidal cycles, you get some low-lying streets underwater. Some people say that even if we stop emissions, there's momentum in the system. Warming will continue, seas will continue to rise. Uh, you know, how much is already baked in? How much sea level rise in, is already baked in? Well, let's first say how much further warming is baked in because a lot of people think we are already inevitably going to surpass the 1.5 degree. That is not what the science is saying. Um, the science uh, suggests that once we have reached zero CO2 emissions, the temperature will not rise further. Great. Let's just hold on to that for a moment to say the science. So sometimes the public discourse gets darker than the science and we get these moments of, of, of light. I want I like to pause and hold on to them that once we stop emitting, the warming will stop. That's really good news. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the good part of us causing it. It means we can stop it. In the global temperature, there's not much inertia. So that, that is really what we have to aim for. Get to zero emissions. Um, before or, or at the time where we reach 1.5 degrees. And that is theoretically possible. With the politics we have now, it is not possible, of course. We have to be treating this problem as a top priority, like a wartime situation, basically, in order to get such a, a really fast uh, uh, end of fossil fuel use. Now, there is, of course, a lot of inertia in the sea level uh, issue because the ice sheets are very slow to melt. That's the main reason, but also heat penetrating into the oceans uh, is also a gradual slow process. So after we stabilize the global temperature, sea level will continue to rise for many centuries. And the best we can hope to achieve by stopping global warming is to prevent a further acceleration of sea level rise. So I heard a lot of positive news there that you hear a lot about net zero goals these days. When we get to zero emissions, that some, some of the bad things will stop pretty quickly. Some will continue slowly, rising seas, but the thermal acceleration. So that really gives me encouragement that these net zero goals we're talking about that are, we'll see pretty immediate effects when we get to get there. It won't be some long delay uh, that we'll see some pretty... Uh, quick results that it's a goal worth fighting for and getting toward. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it over land. When the sun comes up in the morning, you know, it gets hot within hours. So that's how fast uh, the atmosphere responds to a change in radiative forcing. The inertia is in the oceans. And so maybe in, in coastal regions, things will not uh, be noticeable so quickly. But uh, a lot of the CO2 effect is, is very immediate. And with every molecule of CO2 that we add, we change the radiation balance. And once we stop doing this, uh, we will stop making things worse. 
There's a saying that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The jet stream is slowing, according to different studies using different methods. How does the melting Arctic ice affect the jet stream, and how could that affect Europe? I talked to people who are very worried in Europe about the jet stream changing. The changes in the jet stream uh, data show that in summer the jet stream is uh, slowing down. Uh, uh, also, further analysis shows that it's getting more wavy. Um, in the winter, you get these uh, instabilities in the polar vortex, letting out uh, cold air outbreaks from the Arctic uh, to adjacent continents. And uh, these things have to do with the disproportionate warming of the Arctic, which has actually uh, warmed three to four times faster than the global average temperature in, in the last decades. And that basically reduces the temperature gradient that drives the jet stream. You know, the, the difference between the subtropical atmosphere and the polar atmosphere, uh, that the temperature difference is getting smaller because the North Pole is warming up such a lot. And uh, we think that this uh, leads to more persistent weather, especially in Europe. So same weather situation lasting longer and thereby becoming extreme. You know, if you have one week with no rain, it's no, not a problem. But you know, if you have three weeks with no rain, you have a problem. Or when you have a low pressure system dumping a lot of rain, you also have a problem when it stays for a week over the same place because it's going to cause massive flooding uh, like we had last year in uh, Germany, Belgium, um, and the Netherlands. We've had an attack on science and, and a lot of reason-based thinking in the United States seems to have subsided a little bit. What advice do you have to people who want to pursue science and are maybe turned off by the nasty politics surrounding science these days? Um, I would say do it anyway. And uh, I think um, go into the solutions field, you know, study energy systems, etc. Because, uh, yeah, basically, we understand the climate system well enough to know what we should be doing. And uh, we really need people working on the solutions.